heaven, West Virginia. John Denver couldn't have said it better himself. We're in mountain country, riding on West Virginia's best kept secret, the Cass Scenic Railroad. Since being operated by the state in 1963, the Cass Scenic Railroad has carried nearly 3 million people, treating them to some of the most spectacular mountain views that America has to offer. Young and old, the railroad buff, and just your average tourist flock here every year from all over the world to experience the sights, sounds, and even the smells that Cass has to offer. Without a doubt, people of all ages will be pointing out and admiring the beauty of God's country. The Cass Scenic Railroad is a glimpse into a bygone era, an era where steam was king and the work was plenty. Mighty men battled Mother Nature's toughest conditions here, all in the name of progress. Pulled by an extraordinary piece of early 20th century technology, the Shea locomotive, you'll have the chance to see for yourself the challenges these men faced. It's early in the morning on the Cass Scenic Railroad. Hours before the first train departs, the employees are already hard at work preparing for the day's runs. Engineer Brad Hoover and fireman Danny Grog are oiling, greasing, polishing, and fueling the locomotive that is to pull their train on today's run. Old number five, as they call her, will be doing the honors today. Built in 1905 by the Lima Locomotive Works, she's the second oldest Shea-type steam locomotive in operation and the oldest locomotive in the cast roster. Engineer Hoover has been with Cass for over 17 years and enjoys every aspect of his job. But railroading is not just a job for Hoover, it's a passion. A passion he shares with many others here at Cass. Vice Superintendent Ben McCune is proud of the people who call Cass their workplace. They are very devoted to, to Cass Scenic Railroad. They're devoted uh, to what they're doing with these big engines. Uh, I know uh, uh, the other day I had a guy that had a, uh, a stay bolt that was leaking and, and he'd got done, went out, clocked out, went home uh, at 3 o'clock and at 5 o'clock went out there and he was crawled back into his engine again and he remembered something he wanted to do before he left that day. So he came back and, uh, and worked on that engine. Uh, Gary Castle is the one that did it. But this is something that's a common thing. It's, uh, it's because of their love for these engines uh, and uh, their devotion to what they're doing. After servicing the engine, the next step is assembling the train. Each morning, the conductor on duty uses hand signals to communicate with the engineer while switching cars for the trains. Each train is equipped with four to six coaches, depending on which run the train is taking. Shorter trains are the norm for the Whitaker runs, while larger crowds tend to ride the Bald Knob run. Here, conductor Gene Lambert directs the engineer in coupling to a set of rail cars for the Bald Knob excursion. 
After servicing at the shop and the assembly of the train, Shay number 11 backs into Cass Station, where passengers will board the train. Usually, the train arrives at the depot a half hour before departure, giving newly arrived guests the opportunity to purchase tickets before the trip up the mountains. The depot at Cass is the third depot built here. The first and second depots suffered the same fate of being burned down. Today, the Cass depot is used for passengers to purchase tickets to ride the two regularly scheduled excursion trains. As passengers are loaded onto the train, engineer Dirk Calasia and fireman Amy McGrew service Shea number 11 for the long journey ahead. A half hour after the train arrived at the depot for boarding, Shea number 11 charges forward at the steady hand of the engineer and fireman. On the journey up the mountain, the train will travel over five grade crossings. At each crossing, the engineer will sound the whistle with two long blows, a short and one final long blow. This tradition was developed from a British railway and was adopted in the 30s by the American railroads. Two longs, a short and a long is Morse code for the letter Q, which means quarantine, as in quarantine the crossing. Dirk and Amy have to work hard together as a team to get the train up the mountain. Amy's story on how she came to Cass is an interesting one, and being the only woman on the train crew, we had to hear more of her story. The short version of the story is my ex-husband wanted to come to Cass and play trains, and to our surprise, they hired both of us. I spent a year on the track crew, which I really enjoyed. I thought that was about as good as it got, being paid to be on the mountain all day. And then we had two firemen that quit, and I moved into the engine. I've been doing this for eight years now, and I absolutely love it. Uh, it is a very physical job. Uh, I shovel anywhere from two and a half to three and a half tons of coal each day when we're running, and when we're not running, we're doing shop work. It, there's never a dull moment. When you play with antiques, that's job security. Um, challenges are, you know, physical and there was definitely a little trauma around here to having a woman in the engine, but uh, it's been worth every bit of it. Uh, okay, so like uh, a word of advice to any ladies who are interested in a railroad, um, they're maybe maybe be maybe they're nervous about doing it. What what advice would you give to them? Be tenacious. Be tenacious. <laughs> if you want to do it, do it. Um, don't listen to the anybody who says can't. Just go out there and do it. The beauty of nature on the journey to the top of the mountain is breathtaking. However, the journey itself is a hard one. Because of their excellent design, the Shea locomotives are the only thing that can handle such a hard task of pulling a train up grades that reach up to 12% on the mountain. 
Designated Supervisor of Locomotive Engineers Danny Seldomridge shared with us some of the challenges an engineer will face while climbing the mountain, along with how important it is to keep the railroad running. Make sure you've got control of that engine all the time. It's, it's, that's the challenge. It's, you're working the engine on a steep grade. You've got you to know where to carry the water. It's a fine line between having enough water to cover the crown sheet and working water into the throttle instead of steam. What's your favorite thing about being around steam locomotives? The whole steam locomotive. I mean, it's, if you get tired of listening to an exhaust or listen to the whistle blow, there's somewhere else to look. It's all external. There's something flopping around out there to look at. So there's, there's nothing boring about it. It's uh, the only place that I know of that you can see a steam engine, a geared engine. We'll put it that way, doing what it's supposed to do. It, it's the same, it's the same uh, railroad grade it was when it logged. You're carrying about the same load you did when it was logging, so it's, it's great. If you want to see a steam engine work, this is the best place in the world to see. It's great. I hope my, my grandkids, I, I hope it's around for my great grandkids to see every, everything. It's, it shouldn't never be shut down. It shouldn't never be farmed out. There's no way they can make money. Uh, private enterprise, I don't think you keep it running because it, it takes a lot to keep it going and, and keep the engines up the way that the state does. It's, it's a lot of dedication. There isn't a lot of money. You know, no one's ever worked here for the money. We're, we're state park employees. I mean, it's, it's just not there. No one works here for the money. It's the love of the place. Everybody that's here is steam engine crazy and they do it more for the love of it. Just like right now, here we stand six o'clock in the evening trying to get one of them ready to go to Mars. So. Not only are the people of Cass Scenic Railroad extraordinary, so is the history. Founded in 1901 by the West Virginia Pulp and Paper Company, now Mean West Vaco, Cass was built as a company town to serve the needs of the men who worked in the nearby mountains cutting spruce and hemlock for the West Virginia Spruce Lumber Company, a subsidiary of West Virginia Pulp and Paper. At one time, the sawmill at Cass was the largest double-band sawmill in the world. It processed an estimated 1.25 billion board feet, or 104 million cubic feet of lumber during its lifetime. In 1901, work started on the railroad, which climbs back Allegheny Mountain. The railroad eventually reached a meadow area now known as Whitaker Station, where a camp was set up for the immigrants who were building the railroad. The railroad soon reached to the top of Gobbler's Knob and then to a location on top of the mountain known as Spruce. The railroad built a small town at this location, complete with a company store, houses, and a doctor's office. Work soon commenced on logging out the red spruce trees which grew in the higher elevations. Many of the immigrants who built Cass didn't speak English and were only known by their company number tag. The West Virginia Pulp and Paper Company originally had only been interested in the red spruce timber for the purpose of making pulp, which would be turned into paper. It wasn't until a few years later when the company realized that the mountain held a fortune in hardwoods, such as maple, cherry, birch, and oak. The company decided that they would build a mill in the town of Cass, which could process these hardwoods. The railroad eventually extended its track to the top of Bald Knob, the third highest mountain peak in West Virginia. This area was logged of its red spruce and the track was torn up in the early 1910s. The track was also extended to a valley near the town of Spruce at a bend in the Shaver's Fork of the Cheat River. The West Virginia Pulp and Paper Company set up a new town here with about 30 company houses, a large company store, a school, and a pulp mill where the red spruce trees could be processed on the spot. This new town was also named Spruce and the former town received its current name of Old Spruce. In June of 1942, West Virginia Pulp and Paper Company sold the Cass operation to Mower Lumber Company, which operated the line until July 1st of 1960, cutting second growth timber off Cheat Mountain. The mill and the railroad were shut down by Mower in 1960 due to rapid decline of the timber industry in the region. Following the 1960 closure, the rail line, land, and all equipment and rolling stock were sold to a holding company named the Don Mower Lumber Company, which was no relation to the former Mower Lumber Company, and the railroad was conveyed to the Midwest Raleigh Corporation, which started to scrap the railroad and equipment. 
However, a group of local businessmen led by Pennsylvania rail fan Russell Baum convinced the West Virginia State Legislature to make the Cass Railroad a state park. In 1963, the first tourist excursion train left the Cass Depot for Whitaker Station four miles up the line. In 1977, the Cass Scenic Railroad State Park took possession of the entire company town of Cass and the old hardwood mill in Cass. Bud Castle recalls the early days of state operations at Cass and shares some of his favorite memories from his 51-year career with the railroad. When the lumber company closed down here, I was just getting old enough to go to work, and they closed down. I had brothers that worked the logging operations, and uh, of course they closed the job down. Back in 1963, it wasn't no work in this area at all. So if you uh, got a chance to go to work, you jumped at it. So I was lucky enough that they hired me and I, I couldn't give it up, I just stayed here. I started to work here in 1963 when the state started running trains. Uh, I've been here for 51 years. I started out working on the railroad, repairing it enough to get to Whitaker Station. And after that, I went to work breaking on the train. After that, I started firing the train. After that, I was an engineer. I went from engineer to conductor, which was my last job, permanent work, for 28 years as conductor. So I retired then at the end of November in 2003. And uh, I was off of work a couple months, and I didn't like that at all, so <laughs> I came back to work as a temporary employee, and I worked like 10 months out of the year now. As far as being an engineer, I never did care for it. But we had a superintendent here, and uh, he thought I would make a good engineer. So I tried out for two weeks with the other engineers that was running the train, and they said I'd make a good engineer, so then I was stuck with the job. I like the, you know, steam, and I like being around the, the railroad, but like I say too, it's just for a, a good job, which it was really a good, good job for me. I mean, uh, it's really good working for the state of West Virginia. All right, the future of Cass. Um, you think Cass is something worth saving, I imagine? Oh, yeah, I'd hate to see it go, you know. I mean, it's a lot of history. To, to the young person out there who doesn't really understand steam railroading, doesn't understand the importance here at Cass, um, what would you say to them? Well, I think the one young people that's working here, they should try to hang on to it because, you know, it's not too many steam railroads around anymore. And if you've got a chance to, to get in there and get it, I think you should do it. Today, the CAS is still inspiring those who work for the railroad. Vice Superintendent Ben McCune shares how he came to work at the CAS Scenic Railroad and the appreciation he has gained from working around the steam locomotives. Uh, before I came here, I'd served uh, several years with uh, other uh, parts with the Division of Natural Resources. Uh, there is nothing as unique as Cass. Uh, Cass has uh, uh, a history that is unlike anything I, I know of. Uh, my father was a timber man, and uh, the history of Cass is timber oriented. Uh, I have uh, gained a lot of appreciation for the for the engines and for the for the way they work. I, before this, I was not familiar with uh, railroading in any way, let alone steam engines, and so. This has just been a great experience for me. Meanwhile, back on chain number five, engineer Brad Hoover and fireman Danny Grog are hard at work. Chain number five, in charge of the Whitaker run, is closely behind the Bald Knob run, which is powered by chain number 11 with Dirk and Amy. Each train usually operates an hour behind the previous run up the mountain. Normally, the Bald Knob run is the first to depart the Cass Depot. Before each train can make its way to Whitaker Station, they must operate over two switchbacks. 
A switchback is a segment of railroad track that allows the train to climb straight up one side of the mountain, rather than circling over and over to reach the top as one would do while climbing a spiral staircase. When Cass was still a logging operation, this vital track design allowed the transportation of timber to move much faster in order to make delivery deadlines at the mill. Setting up south of Whitaker Station, we were treated to the awesome sights and sounds of Shea Locomotive No. 11 battling its way up the mountain. This S-curve is on a nearly 9% grade. To put that into perspective, a 9% grade is equal to 9 feet of elevation gained over a distance of 100 feet. At this rate, the train could gain a total elevation of 475 feet in one mile. On a normal Class 1 American Railroad, a 1.5% grade over a one-mile distance is considered rather steep. This spot on the railroad is considered one of the most beautiful locations on the way to the summit of Bald Knob and Whitaker Station. During the fall time, the area near the S-curve's beauty is unsurpassed by nature. Through the lens of his aerial drone, Walter Scriptunez captured this incredible scene of Shea No. 5 climbing the mountain, with a stunning backdrop of fall colors surrounding the train. Shea No. 5 often pulls the Whitaker runs, while Shea's No. 11 and 6 primarily command the Bald Knob excursions. At Whitaker Station, the trains will make a stop for the passengers to deboard and grab a refreshment at the snack shop. In addition to the snack shop, Whitaker Station has an array of equipment displays for the passengers to exhibit. A caboose, a steam-powered skidder, and other logging equipment used in the railroad's heyday are a part of the open exhibit. Each piece has an interesting history. The Steam Skidder, built in 1944 for the Meadow River Lumber Company in Raynell, West Virginia. In 1939, Meadow River tried an industry first when it introduced tree-length logging. Two skidders were rebuilt to handle the timber. Built in the company's shops, this skidder received machinery taken from an old factory-built Lidgerwood skidder. It was mounted on a 55-foot railroad car with a half-inch steel bottom built by the company. A 96-foot-long tower was mounted on the front end of the car. The setup site for this rail skidder would have a log storage yard for a half million feet of logs and give the 1 and 7 eighths inch skyline enough of a vertical climb to keep it at least 50 feet above the ground. The skidder was designed to operate in a complete circle, reaching out a distance of about 3,000 feet. A good timber cut could yield as much as 2.5 million board feet logged into one setup, usually 8 to 10 months of operation. The skyline would sag considerably when loaded, and for best operation, most of the load would be carried by the cable rather than dragging on the ground. This skidder operated until 1966 and is one of only two left in the United States. The Metal River Lumber Company ceased operations in 1970. In the early years, logs were rolled by hand onto log cars. This limited the amount of logs put on a car, therefore steam loaders were developed. The American and Barnhart loaders were two of the most frequently used makes. Having a fixed boom, they moved over the log cars on rails, with some models pulling themselves by a cable and winch. After a half an hour with the passengers on board, the bald knob run will continue up the mountain. Dirk and Amy slowly ease Shea No. 11 out of the station. An hour later, Engineer Hoover and Fireman Grog will arrive with their train at Whitaker Station. The same ritual of deboarding and exhibiting the logging equipment will take place before the train returns to Cass. The Bald Knob excursion is a four and a half hour round trip, while the Whitaker Station excursion is only two and a half hours. Regardless of which trip one takes, the scenery is still magnificent.
Ephraim Shea, the inventor of the Shea locomotive, had an amazing life full of many career changes. Originally, Shea was a school teacher, a clerk in a Civil War hospital, a civil servant, a logger, a merchant, a railway owner, and an inventor. He lived in Michigan, near the town of Cadillac. In the 1860s, he became a logger and wished to devise a better way to move logs to his mill instead of on winter snow sleds. He built his own tramway in 1875 on two-foot, two-inch gauge track with wooden ties. This was much more efficient than his competitors since he could log all year round. Two years later, he invented the Shea locomotive. Around the year of 1877, he developed the idea of having an engine sit on a flat car with a boiler, gears, and trucks that could pivot. The first Shea only had two cylinders and the very front truck was mounted normally, while the rear truck was fixed to the frame and could not swivel. This was very similar to normal driving wheels on a larger steam locomotive. He mounted the 3 by 5 foot tall boiler centered on the car with a water tank over the front trucks and the Crippen's engine mounted crossways over the rear trucks. Shea experimented first with a chain drive from the engine through the floor to the truck axle. It is not known if he powered one or both axles, but he soon found that the chain drive was not practical and he next tried a belt drive. It did not take long for the idea to become popular. Shea applied for and was issued a patent for the basic idea in 1881. He patented an improved gear truck for his engines in 1901. Lima Locomotive Works of Lima, Ohio built Ephraim Shea's prototype engine in 1880. Prior to 1884, all the Shea's Lima produced weighed 10 to 15 tons each and had just two cylinders. In 1884, they delivered the first three-cylinder Class B Shea, and in 1885, the first three-truck Class C Shea. The success of the Shea led to a major expansion and reorganization of the Lima Company. When Lima first received the Shea idea, it was not impressed until John Carnes influenced the company to use the design plan. In 1903, Lima could claim that it had delivered the heaviest locomotive on drivers in the world. Lima produced the first four-truck Class D Shea, weighing 140 tons. This was built for the El Paso Rock Island Line from Alamogordo, New Mexico to Cox Canyon, a distance of 31 miles. The railroad line consisted of many winding curves and grades of up to 6%. The use of a two-truck tender was necessary because the poor water quality along the line meant that the locomotive had to carry enough water for a round trip. Lewis E. Feitner, working for Lima, patented improved engine mounting brackets and a superheater for the Shea in 1908 and 1909. After the basic Shea patents had expired, Willamette Iron and Steelworks of Portland, Oregon manufactured Shea-type locomotives, and in 1927, Willamette obtained a patent on an improved geared truck for such locomotives. Since Shea was a trademark of Lima, strictly speaking, it is incorrect to refer to locomotives manufactured by Willamette and others as Shea's. Six Shea patent locomotives, known as Henderson-style Shea's, were built by the Michigan Iron Works in Cadillac, Michigan. Because of their vertical pistons and pivoted trucks, the Shays could pull large loads up steep grades at low speeds between 4 and 7 miles per hour. Today, the Cass Scenic Railroad is still operating at the same speeds as they did back in the logging days. In all senses of the word, Cass is authentic. Cass number 11 was built in 1923. It operated both as a logger and a common carrier locomotive. Until 1965, it served the Hutchinson Lumber Company and then the Feather River Railway as number three. Weighing 103 tons or 204,704 pounds, the wheels are 36 inches and the cylinders measure 14 and a half inches by 15 inches. With a boiler pressure of 200 pounds, Western Maryland Shea number no. six is the only larger Shea at Cass. In 1967, number three went to the Pacific Southwest Railway Museum in San Diego, California. In March of 1997, Cass Scenic Railroad sent a team to Campo, California to inspect number three. The purpose of this trip was to determine the means by which the Big Shea could be transported back to Cass, and to get an idea of the type of repairs that would be necessary to bring the engine back to life. Four men from Cass and six from Mountain State Railroad and Logging Historical Association went to Campo, California to bring the Shea to Cass. Herbert Jones Incorporated of Dunbar, West Virginia was contracted to pick the Cass number 11 up in Campo and see to its arrival in Cass. It took three days to load the massive Shea and have it sent on its way. 
As mentioned before, halfway between Bald Knob and Whitaker Station, the train passes a location known as Old Spruce. The junction leads to the railroad-built lumber town of the same name. As the number of working men increased over the years at the West Virginia Pulp and Paper Company, the cutting and shipping of pulpwood increased enormously. With the increase of workers, three camps were formed. Near the top of the mountain, the second camp was built on the Cheat River. One mile up, the third camp was also built. Through the week, these camps were occupied by many immigrant workers. On Saturday, they would ride the log train to Cass. By Sunday afternoon, they would return to camp on another train. Over time, the shipping of pulpwood increased. Most of it shipped with the bark still on it. This was ruining the pulp and rolls of paper. In effect, hundreds of men were hired to trim the bark from the pulp with axes and spuds. Housing these men became expensive. In return, a peeling plant was built. In 1904, Spruce was moved. This town was less than a mile from the original town. The first town became Old Spruce and the new town became Spruce. Spruce housed the workers of the Rossing Mill, the main locomotive shop, and the town businesses such as the company store, hotel, and the post office. The hotel was built with 40 rooms, complete with a store which was a branch of the Pocahontas Supply Company store in Cass. There were 35 houses and one school. At 3,853 feet, Spruce was one of the highest towns in the eastern United States. At this height, it was normal to have frost in the warmest months of the year. There was no road into Spruce. Because of this, all necessities and materials were brought in by train. Spruce had no cemeteries. Bodies of the deceased were carried out by train. The mill at Spruce was operational from about 1905 to 1925. In the winter months, logs were dumped into a steam-heated pond. This kept the logs from freezing. These logs were then floated to a jack slip. They would later be placed on the main floor of the mill. The logs were then cut into 24-inch blocks which went to the rossing machine. The rossing machine was for debarking spruce trees, which were cut into slab wood. It took seven men to keep the 18 machines operating. In the winter of 1905, 480 men were employed and more to be hired in the spring. In 1906, the population boosted again. Because of the enormous growth in the town, the West Virginia Pulp and Paper Company hired a doctor in 1906 by the name of Dr. Uriah H. Hanna. He remained in Spruce until 1914 when he moved to Cass. Spruce became incorporated in 1909, and in 1913, Spruce was the junction point for the Greenbrier, Cheat, and Elk Railroad. In 1920, the lumber company built a two-room school in Spruce. By that time, the population hovered close to 350. In 1925, the mill at Spruce closed. The town was becoming smaller and smaller, and many of the workers moved to Cass or Slatty Fork, West Virginia. However, they still continued working for the lumber company. On August 31, 1925, the post office closed. Several other logging families still remained. In 1928 and 1929, the Western Maryland Railway took over the greater portion of the GC&E Railroad and the name to take advantage of the developing coal industry of the area. Western Maryland Railroaders moved into the town, which became a terminal for helper locomotives employed in pushing trains over the steep grades over the summit at Big Cut between Slatty Fork, or Laurel Bank, and Spruce. While the Western Maryland Railway served Spruce, the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway served Cass and interchanged there with the West Virginia Pulp and Paper Company. In 1929, another bridge crossing Shaver's Fork was built at Spruce, forming a Y for turning locomotives. A new main line was built east of town, making a big horseshoe that crossed Shaver's Fork at the south end of town and rejoined the original logging grade on the long climb toward the Big Cut. The new line went right across Main Street, eliminating one house. The earth fill for the Shaver's Fork Bridge was dumped right over the former logging main line, burying a stretch of track. The hotel was demolished. A sand tower and a tall 75-ton coaling station were added in 1931 near the water tower. In 1941, Western Maryland Railway built a new engine house in the center of town. The West Virginia Pulp and Paper Company paid a set rate for the right to use the tracks of the Western Maryland. Spruce was now basically used for assembling trains to Cass. In October 1949, construction began on a new engine terminal at Slatty Fork, which was to replace the facilities at Spruce. In 1950, the school was finally closed at Spruce. By 1951, the 20-plus families that had occupied Spruce for a quarter century quickly left for other jobs on the railroad. 
In 1953, diesel locomotives made their first run over the branch. In December of 1954, the water tank was retired. In November of 1956, the Y and remaining sidings were pulled out. Only a couple of houses were left for the occasional use of track gangs, and they were gone by the early 1960s. The Cass Scenic Railroad operates Western Maryland No. 6, the second largest Shea locomotive ever built, weighing in at 162 tons. Shea No. 6 was one of the original locomotives that the Western Maryland Railroad used to haul logging trains between Spruce and Elkins, West Virginia. Built in 1945, Shea No. 6 operated for a total of four years before being retired. In 1981, an exchange was arranged between the Cass Scenic Railroad and the museum for No. 6. Cass offered Shea No. 1 and a Porter 040 type locomotive. The museum accepted and Shea No. 6 was carefully removed from the old museum. It actually was driven onto the turntable and out of the museum using air generated by a compressor. Today, number six is still like new and a spectacular example of the fine technology of geared locomotives. It combines the grace and refinement of the Pacific Coast Shea with sheer mass. Today, there are no signs of life at Spruce. No houses are standing, the mill is gone, and all that is left are concrete foundations of the railroad shops and company homes. Occasionally, the Cass Scenic Railroad and the Durban and Greenbrier Valley Railroad will host an event called the Great Train Race, in which an old-fashioned diesel will race one of the Cass Scenic's Shea locomotives. Though the town of Spruce is lost to history, Cass still has many of the original housing facilities that the West Virginia Pulp and Paper Company built for their employees. A church, a company store, and offices are part of the living museum at the Cass Scenic Railroad. The town of Cass resembles much of what Spruce looked like in its heyday. 20 of the company houses can actually be rented out by tourists visiting Cass for extended stays. The company store is used as a gift shop and restaurant for tourists riding the train and visiting the town of Cass. North of Spruce at a location called Oats Run, Shea No. 11 takes on water. Shea No. 11's water tender holds between 3,500 and 4,000 gallons of water. At Oats Run, the Shays usually fill up a little less than half a tender and the same amount on the way back down the mountain. By the time the train returns to Cass, Shea No. 11 will be down about another thousand gallons of water. After about 30 more minutes, the train reaches the summit of Bald Knob. At an elevation of 4,843 feet, Bald Knob is recognized as being the third highest point in West Virginia. Here, passengers deboard for about 30 minutes and are treated to some of the most beautiful mountain views in the eastern United States. On the east side of the mountain, a deck provides a great outlook for the passengers to observe their surroundings. In the distance, the large satellite dishes of the Green Bank Observatory can be seen from the top of Bald Knob. The Green Bank Observatory uses powerful radio telescopes to peer deep into our universe. Because these telescopes require minimal interference of outside radio frequencies such as wireless internet, cell phones, and local broadcast radio stations, the rural area around Green Bank was the chosen location. The areas surrounding Green Bank, within 100 square miles, including Cass, have no cellular phone service. Therefore, one visiting the area should plan ahead for emergencies and be prepared to drive long distances for medical help. In addition to being able to rent out one of the company homes in the town of Cass, tourists may also rent out a logging caboose on display at Bald Knob for a weekend getaway. At Bald Knob, passengers often bring packed lunches to enjoy at the top of the mountain. Picnic areas provide a great place to snack close to the train while being surrounded by the mountain scenery. After all passengers are accounted for, the train heads back down the mountain. At Oats Run, the train is topped off with water again before heading straight for Cass. During the trip down the mountain, a brakeman at each car applies the needed brake pressure to prevent a bumpy ride down the steep grades. 
Brakemen keep slack action from bunching up the cars, which would make an unpleasant journey down the mountain. The brakemen use hand signals to communicate with each other. Gene Lambert, head conductor, directs each crew member in applying the brake pressure. Two and a half hours later, the train arrives back into Cass, where the passengers deboard for the final time. Though their journey has ended, all walk away with a life-changing experience of riding the rails through the most beautiful scenery that West Virginia has to offer. Many will return to Cass for another glimpse of God's great handiwork across the beautiful land, made possible only by the amazing men, women, and locomotives at the Cass Scenic Railroad. Truly, the Cass Scenic Railroad is a national treasure that should inspire many generations to come. Many will return to Cass for another glimpse of God's great handiwork across the beautiful land, made possible only by the amazing men, women, and locomotives at the Cass Scenic Railroad. Truly, the Cass Scenic Railroad is a national treasure that should inspire many generations to come. At the time this documentary was filmed, the Cass Scenic Railroad was undergoing a major management transition. It was decided within the state of West Virginia that the railroad would be better suited under the management of a private corporation. In 2015, the Durban and Greenbrier Railroad will assume operations of the Cass Scenic Railroad. Many of the employees of the state of West Virginia that were involved with Cass will be transferred to different departments or will be given the option to stay with a new management company. Some of the state employees have retired from the railroad. They will be sorely missed. Whatever the future may hold for Cass, we at Delay and Block Productions wish the new management company a bright one. Thank you for watching Delay and Block Productions. For more great railroad documentaries, visit our website at delayandblock.com and like us on Facebook.